Right, so um, you're the author of the Evolution textbook, right? What made you um, r write this book? What made me write this book was that in the 1970s, when I was a young faculty member and I developed a course on evolution for undergraduates um, in my first, you know, soon after I arrived at Stony Brook University, um, there was no textbook on the subject of evolution. And uh, so I had to just create my own lectures and give students some reading from here and there, but there was no textbook. And at some point, uh, uh, a man named Andrew Sinauer stopped, he was visiting, you know, and he stopped by and, and visited my office and said that t someone had uh, told him that I might be a good author for a textbook on ecology, which I was also teaching at that time. And I said, well, no. Uh, actually, I don't think I would be very good at that. However, there really is a need, and I said there, there already is one good textbook on ecology, but there is no textbook on evolution. Mm -hmm. And so that was what led into his eventually agreeing that I might be a good person to write such a book. And um, that then became a major, it took me four years, I think, because at first I had no idea what I was doing. And the first <laughs> right. edition was in 1979. 1979, yeah. yes, yeah. that's right. Um, so you were actually particularly working on insect plant interactions, right? That's right. So, um, so there are questions, how does biodiversity occur and why we have so much biodiversity and how environment is affecting this biodiversity, right? Um, so which question actually led you to specifically plant and insect interactions? Uh, actually, it, it, the originally that was not a question about insect plant interactions at all. Um, in the 1970s, one of the major questions that people in evolution were asking was what accounts for all of the genetic variation that had been revealed by gel electrophoresis of proteins. Uh, was it, you know, and there was the balanced school that said natural selection was responsible for the variation, maintaining variation, and then there was the, the, um, uh, the, cl the classical school would, and the idea of genetic drift, just a random genetic drift. And one idea was that a possible way accounting uh, selection could account for variation if different genotypes of a species were adapted to different aspects of the environment, different microhabitats or different food or something like that, in which case you could have heterogeneous selection. And I thought, well, this has not been well tested, but we need to be able to compare species in which we know that one occupies a more homogeneous habitat or environment and the other more heterogeneous one. And I thought, ah, herbivorous insects, we know that the most important part of their environment is the host plant. <laughs> and so a species which has one, only one species of plant as a host must occupy a more homogeneous, simpler environment than one uh, insect that eats many kinds of plants. Mm -hmm. And so that led into comparing the amount of genetic well, variation with to see whether the genetic variation was greater in the uh, species which eats many plants than in those species which eat only a single kind of plant. You see. And that then led me into realizing that these are very interesting organisms, very interesting interactions, and that is what happened. I see, I see. So um, I actually wonder about one thing. So uh, as the author of this uh, evolution textbook, right, you're still teaching you're st uh, at um, State Stony University, mm -hmm. yeah, Stonebrook. Um, I wonder about, actually from the students' aspect, but what is it like teaching evolution to the students as the author of the evolution textbook? I don't know. Maybe I should ask this question to your students, right? Yeah, 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 I don't know. <laughs> I'm, not, really I'm not sure exactly what, what, you, what you want to know. Um, I mean, to be like, y you're in the field, you're like the founder of, you know, yeah. many of the studies, yeah. so the, what I want to say is that maybe your students are very... Um, no. No, the, the students at Stony Brook, have, they have no idea that I am, uh, you, th you think that I'm a somewhat famous person. I kind of, well, okay. <laughs> because and I read your uh, the evolution, we use right. that textbook. The also. students at Stony Brook have no idea. Ah. They just think, oh, this is the guy who wrote the book. Okay, so what, you know, we still have to listen to him, you know, they, you know, no, they, have, they, they, they have no idea. I see, you know. I see. So it's, I'm, I'm, I, I am nothing special to them. Um, so, all right. So then, you're also teaching evolution, right? Not just ecology, but also No, evolution. I don't teach ecology okay, anymore. Okay, so you're teaching yeah, evolution. Teach. Um, as far as I know, in the US, some of the schools try to teach both sides of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's both sides, but like, what do, which side you're taking? Okay. Like, do, you, do you agree with uh, teaching? Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that is an issue not in universities or college, mm -hmm. okay? The issue of, of a big debate 
for the um, secondary schools, the high schools, what you know, what here you you call uh, junior colleges, okay. at that, and and also the in the er earlier school, that is where the big battle is between people who say that creation should be taught, mm -hmm. or some kind of n of alternative to evolution. These are people who do not believe in evolution, so that's where the big fight is, yeah. and the question is, should you say, okay, you know teach both of them and let the student make a choice, mm -hmm. or you should just teach evolution. And in the United States, it's very important that we have in the U.S. Constitution, it forbids favoring any religion, or even favoring people who have religion versus no religion. Mm -hmm. Okay, So religion is, is supp to, supposed to be totally separate from anything which is supported by the state. Public education, therefore, which is supported by the state, cannot have any and kind religious. of religious-based instruction. Mm -hmm. okay. And on that basis, the courts, including the Supreme Court of the United States, have said you cannot teach anything which is a religious interpretation of the diversity of life. Mm -hmm. And so there have been many efforts by creationists to put their teaching in some kind of uh, mimicry or, you know, or, or, or uh, teaching it uh, indirectly. Mm -hmm. or in, I mean, and of course, I mean, I completely oppose that. I think okay. that in a science course, you should teach science. And there is no scientific theory or hypothesis for the diversity of life except for evolution. Mm -hmm. If someone comes up with another scientific alternative, okay. But so far, we do not have any. So basically, you're trying to talk to people, like not just to scientists, to general public students, right, about evolution, like in many forms. Um, so then I'm wondering how we can fight actually with the scientific literacy. So m many people conceive it wrongly, right, evolution yeah. theory. Uh, I think you have put your finger on one of the biggest, most important issues, because the issue is, it's larger than just evolution. And it's not as just country-based, it's also in Turkey, for uh, instance. That's right. The that issue time. is science, I know very well. I kn that the issue is scientific literacy. Mm -hmm. And this extends, for example, now we see to global climate change and people denying the science. Mm -hmm. And the science says, yes, this is caused by greenhouse gases and, and by, by human activity. So the big issue is science literacy. And uh, I do not know how to do anything about that except to try to improve the teaching of science in the early years, the, er the basic science courses that students are taking early in their schooling, that teachers should be teaching not only uh, some simple chemistry or not only some simple bi you know, cell biology or something. They should be teaching students how science works. Mm -hmm. How do you know that DNA is genetic material? How do we know that, uh, that uh, chemistry is made of atoms you know, and, and so forth? What is the and what are the alternatives? How do we think about explaining the natural world? Do you understand how the process of science works as a kind of trial and mm -hmm. error of choosing between hypotheses and finding evidence for one versus another? Yes. And most and most people do not have any such understanding. It should start from early ages. Yes. yes. And in education, early That's education. Right. Yes. Um, <laughs> other question is, can I still ask? Two yeah, more? One, yeah, one more. Very one quickly. More. Okay. So most people actually describe the field of ecology and evolution, right, as a descriptive field of science. How far do you think they're from being a predictive field of science? Oh, as predictive? Uh, it depends on how, how much of a prediction you want, how <laughs> accurate a prediction you want. In very broad terms, I think we can, use, we can be predictive. In very specific, exactly numerical terms, hey, look, it's like climatology, or meteor, to be more exact, meteorology. Meteorology is you know, about the weather, is an application of physics. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks physics is a very precise and predictive science. But the physics of, of, of air masses, of ocean currents, of temperatures, and everything is so complicated that physicists who call them meteorologists, you know, who are supposed to be physicists, they cannot predict exactly what the weather is going to be in New York one week from today. Okay. Yeah. But they can predict it's not going to be very hot, you know, because at this time of year it's going to be cold. Maybe not that specific, but in general. That's right. Exactly. And that, and I think I think that it is very much like that for ecology and evolution. I see. Okay. 
then that should probably be all because you don't I have must, much time. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, good. We need to get out. Yeah. Yep.